We're going to talk about two of the most controversial TV shows of the fall, Lord of the Rings, Rings of Power, and the FX adult animated comedy, Little Demon. We've got uh, four other shows to talk about as well. And of course, it was Emmys week, so we've got the Emmys wrap up too. Let's talk TV. Hey guys, Dan here. This is Dan Reviews. Welcome to TV News and Reviews for the week. Yep, we're going to talk about Lord of the Rings, Rings of Power. Uh, we've got two animated shows as well, Little Demon and over on AMC Pantheon. Uh, we're going to talk about the Woodstock 99 documentary series uh, that was on Netflix a few weeks ago. An import from the UK over on Peacock now, Everything I Know About Love. And then also uh, a new animated show for kids from the people that brought us the great Phineas and Ferb. This one called Hamster and Gretel. So we'll get to all that. But uh, first, want to remind you that uh, we do TV news and reviews here every week on the channel. Uh, usually about six new shows that we tackle. And uh, there's always, you know, with the streamers and stuff, year round, there's always a lot of new shows to talk about. So we do that every week here on the channel. So uh, if you are, are new to TV news and reviews, uh, check out some of that stuff. But uh, in news, you know, usually we run through you know, a bunch of different things, casting news and uh, renewals and cancellations and X, Y, and Z. But uh, this week, it was all about the Emmys. The 74th Primetime Emmys was uh, this week. Kenan Thompson was the host. And uh, figure, you know, when, when that happens, usually in news, we just sort of do the rundown for uh, who won the big awards. Now, my buddy Tim and I did a who will win, who should win video um, that, that got a few hundred views. So we love that. Um, and I, I think, I didn't really go back and count, but I think either we tied or I beat him by one because he didn't pick Zendaya, um, but I, he did, I think, pick another one that I did not pick. And then in the guest category, he picked um, Laurie Metcalf for Hacks, who won. I picked Jane Lynch, uh, but then I talked him out of picking Chip and Dale for the TV movie. So I, I, I think it might have been a tie this year. I don't know, but... Um, but in any, any event, there are no ties in the actual awards, uh, not usually anyway. So let's go over who won uh, the, the big show here. Um, all right, so for limited series, we'll start there, I guess. Um, for uh, writing in a limited series, it was The White Lotus. White Lotus pretty much won, uh, except for a couple of the acting categories. White Lotus pretty much won everything for limited series. So they won the writing um, for directing, White Lotus again. Uh, when we go to the acting, it was Murray Bartlett and Jennifer Coolidge, both for The White Lotus for supporting. Um, but then for the lead roles, that's where it differs. It was uh, Michael Keaton and Dopesick, so deserved. We love that. Um, and then Amanda Seyfried for The Dropout, which I still never finished, but uh, I guess I'll have to do that. Um, for variety stuff, Saturday Night Live won the variety series, but it was only up against one other show. This is at least the second year in a row they've done that. It's Saturday Night Live, Black Lady Sketch Show, and nothing else. I'm sorry, if you only have two things up for a category, you got to get a new category. If there aren't enough variety shows um, of that nature, then throw that in with, like, the late night shows. Throw SNL in with, like, you know, um, I, the Last Night Tonight with John Oliver, which was the winner of that. Um, you know, what Seth Meyers, whatever, throw it in with the late night shows because a category of two is, uh, honestly quite lame for uh, outstanding writing for variety, uh, was Jared Carmichael. That's for a variety special, um, for his, um, stand up special, but they count. It's funny. They say outstanding writing for a variety special, but they have, um, the daily show like special in there as well. Um, and then uh, the Norm Macdonald special, but is there writing for a variety show? There isn't, or maybe if there is, it's in like the creative arts Emmys. So I, I don't know. These are just the, they have like three different Emmys shows because they have the daytime Emmys. Um, you know, a couple weeks ago they had that and then they had the creative arts Emmys, which is some of the, you know, the, I don't want to say the lesser awards, but you know, we, we all know. And then the big show. So maybe they had writing for variety show in the creative arts Emmys. I don't know. But uh, for comedy series, it was Abbott Elementary. Uh, Quinta Brunson wrote that. And um, there was some controversy there because Jimmy Kimmel was doing this 
you know, kind of stupid bit, honestly, um, where he was so mad he lost his 13th in a row Emmy, um, that he got so drunk and Will Arnett had to like drag him out. But then they call the award and then Jimmy doesn't get up. The bit doesn't end. You know, I, I think he should have probably been like, okay, bye now. Like bit's over. It's Quinta Brunton's uh, moment. But, but whatever, you know, in my mind, and, and look, her and Jimmy are kind of buddies. You know, he, he gave her the, her, uh, her first late night spot when he saw the Abbott Elementary pilot, um, which, which, you know, he loves. So he's always been one of her supporters. So it's kind of weird, um, that they did that, but she was on his show a couple of days later and, and said, look, you know, whatever it is, what it is. Um, but you know, whatever gets people to know about the show and to watch, you know, maybe, maybe because of that news bit, they'll be like, oh, who's this Quinta Brunson? Oh, she won for writing. Oh, okay, cool. What's the show? And then maybe they'll check out Abbott Elementary. So I, I don't know that it's necessarily a bad thing, um, but yeah, it's a little lame to steal somebody's moment, I, I would say. Um, in, in a writing for drama, it was Succession. Succession won almost all the drama awards, um, but yeah, they, they won for the writing there. For directing uh, comedy, it was Ted Lasso. And for drama, it was Squid Game. Whatever Succession didn't win, it was basically Squid Game. Um, except for, I think, one of the acting ones. But um, they won uh, for the pilot there, Red Light, Green Light. And then Ted Lasso. Um, and I just have to say this. I think Ted Lasso Season 2, which is the season that, that got nominated, it, it might be one of the great seasons of television of all time. Like, Season 1 was, was outstanding. I think it was my number 2 show of the year after, I want to say... Mayor of Easttown, maybe? Um, I'm trying to think of what year they, these were all out, but I think. But for, like, a regular series, Mayor of Easttown, you know, was a limited series. For a regular series, you know, that Ted Lasso would have been number one if I did it that way. But uh, then season two somehow was, like, even better than that. It, it's 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 such an outstanding show. Um, all right, so in limited actor for uh, the... Uh, 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 supporting, I should say, actor and actress for drama, Matthew McFadden for Succession, and Julia Garner for Ozark. I thought uh, Kieran Culkin was going to win. He kind of has some heat on him for that role, but I've never watched Succession, so um, so maybe that's maybe they gave it to the right person. Um, for supporting in comedy, it was Brett Goldstein for Ted Lasso, who plays Roy Kent, well, well deserved, and supporting actress was Cheryl Lee Ralph for Abbott. Um, look, I was pulling for Hannah Waddingham for a, a, a double. You know, I, she won last year. I wanted her to win again this year. Uh, all the Ted Lasso people that won last year won again this year. Um, but I've been following Cheryl Lee Ralph's career since the 80s. I, I love her. Uh, I adore her. She gave one of the all-time great Emmy speeches, I think. Um, so, uh, you know, props to her for sure. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I'm okay with it, you know in that respect. But for lead, you had uh, G Lung, Lee Young Jae for Squid Game for uh, actor in a drama. And then, oh, I forgot. I'm sorry. Succession and Squid Game didn't win. One other one. Zendaya won for Euphoria. I already kind of mentioned that. Um, and she's just lovely. She is uh, a, a record breaker with that uh, role because, first of all, she is the youngest person to win two Emmys in any category. Um, I, I, I think that means in the same category, but she's only what, 20, is she 24 now? Maybe she's still very young. Um, but she is also the only black woman ever to win best lead in a drama two years running. I think there's only been a handful anyway. I'm pretty sure Carrie Washington did it one year for scandal. Um, I could be wrong on that, but I think she did. And then I believe uh, the original winner was back in the 60s uh, for the show. Julia uh, was Diane Carroll. I think that was listed under comedy or under drama, even though it was a half hour show, but it was more dramatic. So I, maybe it was a comedy, though. Anyway, um, but yeah, she's uh, the first black actress to win that award twice, which is amazing. And then uh, for Outstanding Lead Actor, they doubled up from last year. Uh, Ted Lasso. Jason Sudeikis won for actor, and then Gene Smart won for Hacks. I, I admit I have not seen season two of Hacks, um, but, uh, you know, Gene Smart is always great, and of the people up, I would say, you know, she she probably deserved it uh, the most. And then, uh, let's see, we talked about Saturday Night Live, we talked about last week with John Oliver. Uh, outstanding competition program, 
I, I was thinking it would be RuPaul, but it was Lizzo's Watch Out for the Big Girls. Uh, RuPaul won for Best Host of a competition program uh, in the Creative Arts Emmys. So, you know, breaking her own record of uh, most wins in that category and uh, most wins ever by a black performer in any category. Ever, the most Emmys for whatever category. I think she's got... 13 now. We talked about that last week. Uh, but Lizzo's Watch Out for the Big Girls, I, that makes sense for a reality competition program. And she's got such heat on her. For limited, their anthology series, it was White Lotus, like we said. Uh, and then for the comedy series and drama series, it was once again Ted Lasso. And then uh, Succession took the drama. Last year, Succession was in a sort of a bye year because of COVID. Um, so last year, almost all the drama awards went to The Crown. And, of course, The Crown didn't air this year, so, you know, they sort of switched it up. And I don't know what they're doing with The Crown. Um, I don't think we really talked about this last week because I think I recorded the show before The Queen passed. But uh, The Queen, you know, Queen Elizabeth obviously is dead. We know that now. Um, but The Crown has decided to sort of suspend uh, filming for an indefinite amount of time. Um, it will be back, I'm sure, but yeah, for now, in sort of deference to the royal family, they've said, you know what, we're gonna, we're gonna sort of pause this, put a pin in this, so I don't know when we're gonna see season, I guess it's five of The Crown, um, but at some point, I imagine we will see that, but probably not as soon as we had hoped. So, all right, another Emmys in the books, um, we will see what happens, you know, again next year. Ted Lasso is, I guess, going into its third and final season, um, you know, I, I think there are there are some workarounds to that, but you know, Sudeikis and a lot of the um, the people behind Ted Lasso have said if it does go more than three seasons, they're not going to have it be sort of the same characters. They may do like a spinoff of sorts with Roy Kent or something like that, because Breck Goldstein, you know, is 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 heavy with the writing and stuff of the show. But um, but I don't know. But anyway, they haven't even started filming that yet. So will that be on in time for next year's Emmys? I really don't know. They could, they could take a bye year. I'm not sure. Uh, all right, so let's get to the reviews. We're going to start with uh, this Lord of the Rings, Rings of Power uh, on Amazon Plus, uh, Amazon Prime. I almost call it Amazon Plus. They're all pluses now, but no, it's Amazon Prime, of course. And uh, this is set in uh, the world, of course, of the, the Tolkien uh, novels and stuff. Um, this one, the second age, they're calling it, of Middle-earth. Thousands of years before The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings. So we're not going to see those characters. And I, I believe, from what I read, um, they could not, they didn't have access to any of those characters anyway from the Peter Jackson things. And this is all so weird. This, this show has so much bizarre controversy. So Peter Jackson, of course, directed uh, the Lord of the Rings movies. I think he directed The, the Hobbit ones, too. I, I'm pretty sure. Um, but he definitely directed the three Lord of the Rings, and obviously they were all nominated for Best Picture, and one of them won, and it was, you know, amazing series. Um, so they reached out to him and said, hey, would you like to, you know, sort of collab on this or produce it or something? Um, and he was like, sure, get me some scripts, because I want to, before I sign on, I want to, you know, make sure it's it's worthy. And then they just never, he never heard from them again. <laughs> so, like... So I, right away, when I read that like a year ago, I was like, well, that's kind of weird. Well, I read that factoid months ago, but um, but when I heard that he wasn't really involved with the show, I was like, all right, we'll see how that goes. Um, but then the other thing is, this is the most expensive TV show ever made. Um, they have they have sunk uh, about a billion dollars into uh, the, the first season. That includes now the rights to the stuff. Um, and those rights, I believe, go for five seasons. So it does, doesn't does just incorporate the first season. But in terms of the filming, I think about $500 million went into filming this first season. That is, for TV, that's nuts. For a show that's only, I think, going to be eight episodes, maybe ten, but still. Like, that's crazy money. Um, Disney doesn't even spend that on their Marvel shows, which, and they spend a lot of money on those too, but, so, uh, most expensive show ever made, so that's that. And then, even before the show came out, when people were able to start rating it and reviewing it on things like IMDb and Rotten Tomatoes, well, the, uh, you know, the, the, you know, white supremacists, like, you know, I guess you want to call them, the, the racist a-holes out there, uh, you know, all had things to say about, 
the uh, the makeup of the cast because they're, oh my God, there's people of color in this cast. Middle Earth doesn't have people of color. Newsflash, they're all fake people. It's like the, the whole Little Mermaid controversy. Mermaids aren't real people, so it doesn't matter. Um, but anyway, so all of that stuff <laughs> sort of, um, I, I don't know, put, I think, a pall over kind of the, the beginning of this show. Um, of course, my grade doesn't reflect, you know, any of that stuff. I, I base things on, Okay, what does what does the show look like? What does it do for me? How is it, uh, you know, how is it? But here's the thing. This whole Lord of the Rings thing, much like Game of Thrones, which uh, I reviewed, was that two weeks ago, I think, um, with the new Game of Thrones show, I am not, like, the biggest fan of all this, like, big, broad fantasy stuff. I have seen the Lord of the Rings films. I saw them one time only in theaters, but it was the director's cut. It was like a re-release. So I've seen, you know, a lot. Um, and I think it's fine. Like, it's it's great. It, it obviously looks amazing. The acting's so great. The story's great. Um, it, it's just, it's not something that I would put on. You know, oh, what? you know, I have three hours to kill. I guess I'll watch a Lord of the Rings movie. That's not me. Um, but obviously they're, they're very well done. So this is, this was never, I think, going to be the kind of show, much like the Game of Thrones thing a couple weeks ago, that I am going to go back to and check out. Um, so, you know, how, how is it for what it is? Well, first of all, it is probably the best looking show I've ever seen in my life. You can really tell that they sunk money into this show, even if you didn't know beforehand that this is the most expensive show ever made, blah, blah, blah. It looks it. I mean, the trees and the lush landscapes, it reminded me of the movie, like, Avatar. Like, the, the atmosphere of this and the look and the beauty of this show, it reminds me of Avatar, which, you know, is not a movie I particularly care for, but it looked great, right? Um, and we'll see what happens when Avatar 2 comes out. But, so, right away... You are, at least I was, sucked into this world um, because it just, it looks amazing. And my TV's not even that big. I have a bigger TV downstairs than I used to now, but um, but I watched it upstairs uh, where I work. And the TV is a, a moderate size, let's say, um, but it looked gorgeous. This is one you don't want to watch on your phone. You don't want to watch it on, on your iPad. Watch it on a screen, on a big TV. TV screen, because uh, that is what will do it. But but anyway, um, we haven't even gotten to, <laughs> to the cast and the premise. Um, most of the people I, I don't really recognize, to be honest, which I think is good. I think it's probably best that we don't know necessarily who these people are. But uh, Moyford Clark uh, plays sort of the lead here, this elven warrior called Gal Galadriel. Um, and then there's, you know, Lenny Henry, Will Fletcher, Fabian McCallum. I don't know any of these people. Um, so that's, that's kind of how we are. But yes, this is set thousands of years, uh, beforehand. It begins with, uh, some, some relative peace in, uh, the, the, the middle age here, um, or the, the middle earth second age, I should say. Um, and then they're, they're looking for the, the rings of the power, the rise of this dark Lord Sauron. Now, of course we've heard Sauron. We've heard that name before. Um, and then the fall of the Island King and, um, or the kingdom, I should say. And then uh, this is kind of the era of the last alliance between elves and men. So we see all of this sort of play out. Um, we're getting to know the characters. We are getting to know the world. Even though we know Middle Earth, we don't quite know everything about the world. Um, look, this is, I think, for people that like Lord of the Rings, this is going to hit that spot. Um, I, I do think maybe they're going to be a little bummed. Oh, there's no... Gandalf, for example, or or whatever. But this is, uh, you know, thousands of years beforehand. I guess Gandalf probably still would exist, but um, but not sort of in, in this realm, in this in this world. Uh, and I think that's okay. You know, I, I think to redo the movies, which I think most fans would agree are basically perfect. Um, I think it wouldn't have, there wouldn't have been a point to it. They had to kind of do something a little bit different with it. Um, was everybody going to be pleased with this? No, I don't think that's, <laughs> in this day and age, I don't know if it's possible to please everybody. Maybe Ted Lasso. Um, <laughs> that's about the only thing. Um, so it was just never going to happen. Um, but it looks gorgeous. It's acted, uh, wonderfully. Um, uh, you know, look, it's a little boring for me personally. 
I think that's safe to say. But, um, uh, you know, I would like them to get to some of the, the plot schematics a little quicker. We're, we're really doing all the character development, you know, in, in the first uh, couple episodes here. I, I could use a quicker pace, um, but it's a gorgeous looking show. I give The Rings of Power a B plus. Uh, I, I think I liked the pace of the Game of Thrones a little bit better, but, um, but yeah, very much in that sort of same vein of looks very gorgeous. They put a lot of obviously effort into this. All right. So up next, we're going to talk about Little Demon. This is a bit controversial as well because they were airing commercials for this on some football games and people were up in arms about it because, oh, it's, you know, a mature show for adults and Disney's behind it and, you know, all, all the lies on the internet. Oh, Di I can't believe Disney Plus is behind this show. And it's not on Disney Plus morons. It's on uh, FXX and subsequently on Hulu, which, yeah, okay, they're owned. I, uh, yeah, Hulu is majority owned by Disney. That's fine. Um, but anyway, this is uh, featuring the voices of Aubrey Plaza, love her, Danny DeVito, and Lucy DeVito. And uh, this is, uh, was it based on a comic? I'm not sure. Um, but in any event, uh, so this woman, uh, who is played in the present day by Aubrey Plaza, Lara, uh, was being, uh, impregnated by Satan, who is played by Dana DeVito. We love, uh, we love him. And so they have this spawn and, uh, Chrissy is the name. And now she is a teenager and she's coming into her own and she is the Antichrist. Um, and they're trying to live an ordinary life, but obviously that's not happening. They are uh, fighting for the custody of uh, the daughter's soul. Um, Michael Shannon also appears in this as a uh, recurring character. And listen to this this cast list of guest stars. Um, a lot of these I have not run into yet. I've only seen the first two episodes. But Arnold Schwarzenegger, Rhea Perlman, of course, uh, the wife of Danny DeVito. That makes sense. Mel Brooks, Dave Bautista, um, Pamela Adlon, who uh, does... Lots of voice work, but she was also in the FX show Better Things. Um, and uh, William Jackson Harper from The Good Place. So, like, what what a nice guest list for uh, this show. Uh, this show is very funny. I get the controversy. Yeah, I wouldn't want my kids to watch this either. But uh, guess what? Like most adult animated shows, it ain't for kids. You know, The Simpsons is probably... I, I think they would still call The Simpsons an adult animated show, but I think that's probably the only one. And Bob's Burgers, I suppose kids could, could watch for the most part. But, um, but yeah, I mean, this is vulgar. It's uh, got a lot of uh, beheadings and possessions and all of this kind of stuff. Um, but it's also funny as hell. I think a lot of the animated adult shows that we talk about on this show um, that I watch, you know, to review are very, like... And they're real hit or miss. Some of them do this well and, and others not so much. But a lot of them, they are all about just let's throw some curse words in there. Let's just be as gross as we can be without really having a story, without having character development. Just the first episode alone of this has a ton of character development. We learn so much about what's going on uh, with these people. Aubrey Plaza um, is... I think almost unrecognizable in the role. Usually she does that sort of deadpan uh, delivery that she did for Parks and Rec, and most of her movies go like that. And uh, even when she was in Monsters University, she was kind of doing that that same delivery. Here it is completely different. Um, she is, you know, a lot more active, a lot more energetic. Um, and it's really cool to see. You know, I, I would not have guessed that it was her if I didn't know. Danny DeVito, of course, is DeVito, as always. Um, but Lucy DeVito is his daughter, which I don't know if she's really done any any other things. Have we seen her in things? Um, I'm sure we probably have, right? She is best known for her role as Stephanie in Melissa and Joey. That was that uh, show with Melissa Joan Hart and Joey Lawrence 10 years ago on, uh, was that on lifetime or something so all right i guess maybe we don't know much about her um in her other filmography uh she's got some very very small roles and things yeah i mean I, okay she had a little arc on mrs mazel all right so for the most part though i haven't seen her in in anything but um uh, but she's great here as well as uh, as the daughter this is a funny show um and yeah it's it's not for kids. Now, my only issue with it is 
is it going to get repetitive, you know, um, because really the, the whole theme of it is trying to get the custody of her soul. Um, and we see her kind of as a coming of age story. Okay, but are they going to give us more to go on than that? I'm not sure. But these first couple episodes are are really funny um, and, and good stuff. So I leave Little Demon with a B+. Plus. All right, another adult animated show. This is this goes in a different direction. I mean, kids could watch this, but I think they'd be bored with it. But it's not filled with explicit uh, ex expletives and all that kind of stuff. But it's called Pantheon. It is on AMC Plus, and uh, this one is based on a series of short stories um, called the Acop Apocalypse Triptych, um, and this features uh, voices like Paul Dano, Aaron Eckhart, Rosemary Dewitt, Taylor Schilling. Um, but the main character is uh, Katie Chang. Uh, she plays Maddie Kim here, and this is a a sci-fi show. Um, this is not, you know, a lot of these other shows are um, more like this. Okay, this kind of reminds me of um, uh, what the heck show is it? It was like my number one show for 2019, but it had such a kind of generic name. Um, Oh man, and I can see the poster for it too. Alright, anyway, it's a one word title. I I when you review two hundred and fifty plus shows every year, it's like uh, things really get lost in, in the sauce. But um but it reminds me of of that in the vein of the look of it. It doesn't look like your typical adult animated show on like Adult Swim or Fox is more, I would say, of a standard uh, you know, type. But this is this actually kind of looks like an anime almost. It looks like what I would call maybe like a more soft anime, like an anime movie, like a Miyazaki kind of thing. Not, you know, where the, the girl's eyes are huge and they've got big boobs. It's not, it's not like that, but, um, but yeah, it's like, you know, a Miyazaki type of animation, um, if you're familiar with him, but, um, it's all about, uh, this, this family and they are, um, you know, it's a world where, uh, you can upload your memories. Was that show called Up? No, because there's another show called Upload. But it reminds me a little bit of that in the in the plot too, um, which I think was on Amazon a couple of years ago. That lasted, or maybe it's still on. Um, but I think there's two seasons up of that. Uh, Undone is the other show that I'm thinking of. That's that's Upload. Undone. I you know I get them confused. But yes, Upload. Um, it was an amazing adult animated series. Um, and that they did like rotoscoping that that's not this, but the look of it was very different from other adult animated series. And this, we get the same. It looks very, very different from uh, other things I've seen. My big problem with this one is certainly the pacing. These are hour long episodes, 40, 45 minutes, really. Um, but, uh, you know, yeah, we're getting to know the characters a bit, but they don't really dive into the plot hardly at all in that first episode. We don't really even find out what's going on with the upload stuff and, and what the, the whole point of the characters are. Really, they don't get into that until the second episode. We're really getting to know these characters. And unlike Lord of the Rings, where there's a lot of different characters and types of characters to get to know, really we're learning mostly just kind of about... Um, you know, the, the main, you know, five or six people here, the main family, and uh, maybe a couple others in that first episode. So I was sort of hoping that the pace would, would keep moving on here. Um, but I certainly see some merit in this. I imagine it uh, is a limited series, but I don't know. Um, it doesn't say it's limited, but I guess because it's based on a series of short stories, I suppose they could have more coming in or, or, um, you know, whatever. I don't know how many they go over in this, but, um, but yeah, I, I like this. I think the pacing is an issue. Um, these, these could have been half hour episodes for sure. Um, so I, I will uh, knock it down a little bit for that. Uh, but I'm going to leave Pantheon with a B. I could go B minus on it depending if they pick up the pace or not, but for now I will leave it with a B. All right. So next let's go to Netflix for Trainwreck. Woodstock 99. Uh, I'm going to actually, I think it's going to be my next TV news and reviews is going to be an all Netflix special because Netflix has put out a bunch of shows in the last like month or so that I just haven't gotten to. Everything else is, is sort of, you know, taken precedence and, um, but they just every week they have one or two new shows coming out. And so I thought, all right, well, I'll do a whole Netflix special, but I had room for, uh, an extra show this week. And so this one came out about a month ago at this point. Um, and I had not watched it originally because, I watched a uh, a documentary movie about Woodstock 99 
Last year, I gave it an A. It was fantastic. I think it was in my top 10 of the year for movies. So I thought, eh, you know, I've kind of I've kind of done it. I've seen it. And this is only a three-episode, you know, docuseries. So I, usually when they're that short, I, I won't really cover it because I'm like, oh, you know, it's it's almost like a movie at that point, kind of. It's when it's less than three hours. But I ended up binging all three episodes yesterday. Um, and it's, <laughs> it's great. I mean, like... I. The Woodstock 99 thing is fascinating to me because at the time, and I talked about this when I did the, the movie uh, review for it, but at the time I was programming an alternative rock radio station and, you know, we were all part of this sort of culture of playing these, you know, hard rock, new metal bands, Corn and Kid Rock and Limp Bizkit um, and, and all that stuff and sort of ushering in this this era of really, really angry white kids um, you know, college age and, and less, um, that basically, you know, caused the destruction of Woodstock 99. But as the movie explores, this documentary explores as well, did they really, you know, cause it or was it more the promoters taking advantage of them and not having uh, any good, uh, water or not letting them bring in their own water on, you know, the hottest days of the year, um, you know, ushering in all this angry music to the stage. Um, you know, there, there's, I think, enough blame to go around, and uh, this this show explores that a good bit. Um, some of the interviews are the same. They both interviewed Jonathan Davis of Corn. They both interviewed Jewel. They both interviewed uh, the director of Woodstock. Um, but, you know, they, they sort of differ from there. Um, this one interviews a few other different artists uh, than the movie did. Uh, they interviewed different people from MTV than the movie did. Um, I, you know, it, it's an interesting companion piece for sure. I don't think you need to watch both though. I think either or will give you what you need in that respect. Um, this one is interesting because it, it takes it day by day. The first day is Friday of Woodstock and the whole sort of planning phase. Then the second episode is Saturday. The third episode is Sunday and the aftermath. And so it's an interesting look that way, um, whereas the movie, I think, maybe jumped around a little bit more. But in both cases, I just it, – it has stuck with me. That movie I still think about all the time because it's so insane to me that this was able to, to happen the way it did and, and, and all of that. Um, I, I find the subject matter of Woodstock 99 – fascinating as a as a music fan um as a concert fan and as somebody who was sort of you know really in that industry at the time um and and uh, you know my buddy jason and i had thought about going up to woodstock 99 i'm glad we didn't i guess in in the aftermath but um to say that i was there maybe would have been cool as long as i stayed alive but um but yeah i mean i i, I think uh this lays a little more blame on the promoters than anything else. Whereas the the movie, I think, sort of also blamed a couple of the artists for encouraging it. Um, and this did too. But anyway, I don't think you need to watch both, I guess is my point. Both are done very well. Both are, are excellent accounts of the events. Um, I, I would say I'll give this one a slightly lower grade just because um, I, I personally already sort of saw the whole thing, I, you know, and it's hard to forget that I did see the whole thing. Um, so a lot of it for me was just sort of repetitious um, in, in that regard. But it also was a bit repetitious with itself. Like the third day, Sunday, when all the the really bad like riots and stuff were happening, how many times can you hear a talking head say something to the effect of, it was anarchy. It was like Lord of the Flies. It was like nothing I ever seen. It was like for 10 minutes straight, we just heard people saying that. We got it. You know, we can see it on the video. They got some great video too um, for this. But yeah, this is another one, you know, if you didn't watch the movie, I would say definitely check this out. I leave Trainwreck Woodstock 99 with an A minus. All right. So next is uh, Everything I Know About Love. This is uh, originally from um, the BBC and now it is on Peacock. You can stream it there. Um, it's a seven uh, seven part first season, um, but this is based on a a memoir, a fiction memoir, whatever that means, um, of the same name. And uh, there's nobody really that I think you would recognize here. Um, well, Belle Powley, I recognize that name, but when I saw her, I didn't really know who she was. But uh, she's she mostly does BBC stuff. So, um, but anyway, this is uh, sort of. 
um, like, I don't want to say Friends-ish because it's not a sitcom. Um, I would say maybe more like a slightly more dramatic Sex in the City kind of thing, um, I guess I would say. Um, because you have all of these, it's not just women though, you know, Sex in the City, you think of, um, obviously, you know, mostly women, but, um, no, this is, you know, guys and girls and they are navigating, you know, in their mid twenties, I would say kind of navigating, um, their, their lives and their love lives specifically. I think that is kind of what most reminds us of sex in the city um is is that it's pretty much about their love lives and um all of that kind of stuff um I, I think it's good but i don't think it's anything that we haven't seen before like i feel like this is one where it's it's been kind of played out especially in the streaming age when all these streamers are, are putting up you know a show a week or, or in some cases multiple shows a week We've seen a lot, even Peacock, they did a show called Five Bedrooms, I think two years ago, um, that I gave an okay grade to, but then I went back to it and started watching it again. I was like, you know what, this is, I, I don't know, I'm kind of over this, like I'm not going to finish it. Um, and it reminds me a little bit of that, and that was also an import from the UK. Um, and that was, you know, it had a little bit of a different vibe to it, I think, maybe slightly more comedic. Um, but I just, I feel like we've been down this path so many other times with so many other shows, um, that there's nothing inherently wrong with this show. It's, the acting's fine, the writing is okay, um, but I, I don't know that there's, like, an ounce of originality in it. There, there isn't, like, one character that necessarily stands out to me as being something a little different, um, you know, the, the lies of these people intertwining the um you know the, the characters themselves nothing about this um is original at all but it wasn't bad like i wasn't bored watching it i i am fine with it but there's so many of this type of show um that i just i know peacock's got to up their slate and stuff but to me they're just there just doesn't seem like there's enough to um to be anything that that stands out um, so I will leave everything I know about love with a C plus. It's perfectly fine, um, but just not original at all. So, all right, finally, we will close with uh, a kid's show. If I have a kid's show on the docket, I usually will close with it. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of the younger kid's shows I don't review anymore. Um, we used to, <laughs> I used to review like preschool shows for whatever reason, I guess, cause I have small nephews and whatever, but, um, but I don't really do that anymore. But if it's like a, you know, a, a tween show or like a, a show for, you know, kids my nephew's age, which is like in that seven to 12 kind of range, um, I'll, I'll still review it. But when I saw this was from the Phineas and Ferb team, the creator of Phineas and Ferb created this, I was like, all right, well, I, I got to check it out though, because Phineas and Ferb is hilarious. Um, you know, it's, it's one of the best kid shows uh, that's been on in a while. But uh, this is on Disney Channel originally, but uh, you can see the episodes on Disney Plus as well. Hamster and Gretel is uh, the name of it, and it follows this, this girl, Gretel. And her pet hamster, uh, after receiving uh, abilities from an alien, superhero abilities, um, and now their uh, protective brother Kevin uh, must work with them to uh, to you know sort of keep their identity a secret, and also um, you know give them rides everywhere you know that they don't want to fly. But Michael Cimino from Young Victor plays the brother. Beck Bennett from Saturday Night Live voices the hamster. And then uh, the gal that voices Gretel, I'm not familiar with. Melissa uh, Pavanmir voices Gretel. But uh, this was commissioned for 30 episodes. Now, I think when they say episode, it's one of these things where there's two, like, segments in an episode. So really, I think there's only probably 15 half-hour episodes, um, but 30 sort of segments. Um, I, I would say, but, uh, this is not quite as funny as Phineas and Ferb, but, um, I definitely got some, some laughs from this. I was, um, <laughs> sort of floored by, um, by how funny it was, um, uh, with, with kind of a simple concept. Um, Joey King does a voice here too. Again, talk about unrecognizable Aubrey Plaza, but, uh, I, I've seen Joey King in like three movies in the last couple of months. The Kissing Booth 3 and Bullet Train and uh, The Princess on Hulu. And I, I didn't recognize her in this at all. If I didn't know it was her, would have no clue. She is 
I think she's really going to be a talent in the next few years. Um, you know, if she finds the right project that makes her a, a really big breakout star, because I think she's got a lot of talent. But she, like, plays the best friend um, of Gretel here. And um, it's a little bit silly that nobody, including the best friend, uh, has a clue that, oh, my best... And she even says it in the first episode. They sort of do a wink-wink thing where, oh, I have a best friend named Gretel, uh, too. And she's got a hamster, too. And isn't that weird? Would you sign this autograph, you know, for her? Um, you know, it's like, all right, you know, now, now we're being silly, but they're kind of leaning into that old trope, you know, from the old Superman show and stuff. So, um, so it's okay. But yeah, I mean, look, this isn't as funny as Phineas and Ferb and it does sort of have a similar, like Phineas and Ferb, it was like they were boys and the, the sister was always put upon and ignored and whatever here, they sort of twisted on its head. I don't think we've met the parents yet. Um, you know, the parents sort of did factor into Phineas and Ferb, but here it's like, you know, the, the brothers is, is put upon and, and never listened to and all of this. And it's the sister who is, you know, got the uh, abilities. So it's, it's a little bit of a, a gender bend version, but yeah, there's some similarities there, but I, I thought this was a pretty fun show, um, to add to the Disney roster. So I'll leave Hamster and Gretel with an A minus. I would say it's the best show of the week. Um, along with Woodstock, I suppose. Um, but yeah, so, all right, no real bad shows this week. Sometimes we get uh, a crop of bad ones, but next week with the six Netflix shows that I'm going to review, I bet there's going to be at least one or two bad ones in there. Netflix is all about the quantity and less, I think, these days about the quality. So we'll find out if that's true next week on the all Netflix show. And then uh, in a couple of weeks, we're going to have the broadcast uh, primetime show episode. Uh, I have corralled my buddy Tim into joining me for that. We've never really had a guest um, so much on the TV news and reviews to talk about new shows. Um, so we're going to talk about, you know, everything that premieres. I think the last big show that premieres on a network is October 8th, maybe. So, we, you know, we're still a few weeks away from doing that show, but uh, that'll be one coming up as well. So thanks so much for watching. We'll see everybody next time on Damn Reviews It.